Never alone. That was stunning. What a beautiful way to begin the morning. Good morning, everybody. For those of you who were not here yesterday, my name is Claire Peeps. For those of you who were, I'm still Claire Peeps. Um, and uh, we welcome you to another morning of Idea Labs. For those who are joining us today, we know that we are, our work is rooted in art, and we are beginning our day with art. And I want you to acknowledge that the artists who are presenting had to be here at 6.30. So that, yes. <laughs> so before we begin and before I introduce them, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to do so, I uh, just want us to think for a minute to collectively about how we are supporting the generative side of art making. Even if we don't support artists directly, and in truth only really a small number of us do, let us at least think deeply about the critical if indirect pathways that our funding can ultimately provide to working artists. Durfee provided grants to working artists for about 15 years through a program called the <clears throat> Artist Resource for Completion. The last stretch of that program we did with the Center for Cultural Innovation. And at about the 10-year mark, I wrote a short essay for the reader called 10 Years and 10 Lessons about supporting individual artists. And I wanted to share five of them briefly with you this morning. And they are, one, artists don't want to be categorized by discipline or career level, but we keep doing it anyway. Two, funding is needed at all levels of artistic development. Three, artists support artists so that grants to artists have a very high multiplier effect. Four, grants encourage artistic risk-taking. And five, optimism matters. And I want to linger just for a minute on that last point. We hope that our small grants program would foster a climate of optimism here in, in LA in the arts, but we knew that that would be very difficult to measure. About 10 years in, we found that we could. Artists told us, and we got the data, that the very existence of a program that they could apply to, and the fact that they knew artists who had received awards, and that their own odds of getting one weren't so long, that that very possibility allowed them to loosen an otherwise anxious grip on their work and to take creative risks that they wouldn't have otherwise. So I just want to share this morning the thought that grants to artists, even small ones, foster optimism in our field. And that optimism, I think we could define as the emotional resilience of a community, is very much in our purview as grant makers. Indeed, I would say it's our responsibility. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers this morning. It's Rostin Wu, is a designer, writer, and educator living here in LA. He produces civic scale artworks and works as a collaborator and a consultant to a variety of grassroots and nonprofit organizations, including the American Human Development Project, the Black Workers Center, Esperanza Community Housing Corporation, as well as the city of LA and LA County. His work has been exhibited at arts, architecture, and design institutions across the country and at various piers, public housing developments, tugboats, shopping malls, and parks. He's the co-founder and former executive director of the Center for Urban Pedagogy, a New York-based nonprofit dedicated to using art to design, foster, and, and to foster civic participation. Please welcome Rostin Wu. So um, I'm just going to stand here. Yeah? yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Great. Um, thanks. Good morning. Uh, I'm Rostin Wu. Uh, I'm going to try to play a slide. All right, um, so the work I'm gonna talk about today um, in my eight minutes is the work of interpretation, um, and specifically trying to work in this place I would call the interpretive layer. So you have an observer, you have a landscape, and I'm going to argue that you know, between those two things, a lot of really important work can and should, should happen. And so I'm gonna talk about three things that interpretation can do. Um, so the first thing is I think interpretation can make something legible. Um, this is a project called Vendor Power. I produced it um, when I was uh, the director of the Center for Urban Pedagogy. And this is a project that was a collaboration between a membership-driven uh, legal rights advocacy group, the Street Vendor Project, um, and a designer, uh, Candy Chang. And so if you look at these slides, I don't know if you can see them very clearly, but this is currently, um, these are examples of some of the legislation around uh, street vending. These are the, this is where you're allowed to vend uh, in Manhattan. <laughs> 
Um, so as you can see, even if you're a native English speaker with a law degree, this would be a fairly difficult thing for you to understand um, exactly what your rights and responsibilities are in this situation. So we worked with the Street Vendor Project to turn this kind of code, which is spread across like three different types of administrative um, systems, um, you know, regulating everything from like street traffic to, to food safety, um, and try to distill it into this, which is a fold-out poster um, that explains your, your rights and responsibilities as a vendor. And it's not just a tool for communication for vendors to understand like, you know, what they're allowed to do, where they're allowed to put their tables, where they're allowed to place their boxes, but also a tool for communication. Um, in interactions with store owners or with police, it's something that they can pull out and point to, well, this is where I know I'm allowed to be, this is where I know I'm supposed to, supposed to, to vend. Um, and so it uses you know, as little, like, uh, you know, little language as possible, it's all visual um, and numeric. Um, on the reverse side, there's oral histories of street vendors and a description of the kind of the overall legal framework of street vending in New York City um, and in five ways that the Street Vendor Project suggests that, that that regulation could be reformed. So this is something where we uh, distributed uh, 10,000 of these through the Street Vendor Project and as kind of a nice coda to it, um, the Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, Department of Consumer Affairs in New York decided that it was something that they actually should be doing themselves and printed an additional 10,000 and now distribute it to street vendors themselves. So that's an example of something where I think that visual work can really help make something that is formerly almost impossible to understand, you know, really readily accessible. Another thing that interpretation can do is to make something complicated. This is a project I've been doing this last year at a spot called the Bowtie Project. Uh, it's a little strip of state park land, or it's owned by state parks. It's adjacent to the LA River. And um, it's, you know, if you go there, it mostly looks like an industrial site now. But they're putting programming there to help people kind of bring people to the river and change the way they think about that site. So this is a site where you know, there's actually kind of a, a lot of uh, programming around it already, done by state parks in an organization called Clock Shop. Um, these signs try to kind of complicate that situation a little bit. So this is a, one of them. It uh, talks on the left about river hydrology and on the right about sort of the relationship between public investment and kind of private investment, private gains. So the way that uh, the public development of a park might in, you know, increase real estate values in the neighboring areas. Um, so kind of complicating that space a, a little bit further. Um, the sign next to it is a map of, of the parcel and also talks about camping. And the reason why it talks about camping is because one of the things that State Parks is trying to do is, uh, is bring people to the river in these urban campouts. But the sort of the interesting, so on one side, there's a history of camping and the development of the, of the organized campsite. And on the other side, there's a description of um, kind of the criminalization of homelessness in, in New York City and the way that another form of camping, which also definitely takes place in this exact same stretch of the LA River, is you know, actively criminalized and, and made into something that people are, are really not allowed to do. So there's a simultaneous encouragement and criminalization that's happening on that site. And so um, you know, they bring all kinds of tour groups out here. Girl, this is a Girl Scout troop that's camping on the site. Um, and the idea is to sort of make this place that you know, might seem very legible, very understandable, and turn into something that, that becomes a little bit more of a, a richer, more complicated experience. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the way that interpretation can make something just visible. Um, this is a project I did a few years ago for the LA County Arts Commission, um, and this is a project based in Willowbrook. So Willowbrook is a, uh, it's a little stretch of unincorporated LA County in between Watts and Compton. And the way that a lot of the planning that's been happening, there's been a lot of public investment there and a lot of planning has been, is underway. And I was sort of brought in to sort of bring some kind of arts, <laughs> an arts angle, I guess, into that process. And it occurred to me after familiarizing myself with that situation that a lot of the way that the consultants and the planners who'd been brought in approached that neighborhood was really just as a kind of a place of pathology, a place that's broken, a place that has gangs or drugs. Um, and they were sort of like, well, how can we make some projects to just kind of like help fix this messed up place? You know, like maybe there should be like a bike path and a farmer's market. And everything was kind of coming from a place of, uh, of you know, just seeing what was wrong. So I thought the most useful thing I could do in that situation would maybe find a way to kind of make visible other things that were happening in this, what is actually kind of like a very beautiful rural, um, you know, neighborhood. Um, so part of that project, you know, there was a home and garden and vehicle tour, and then there was a book that documented, uh, documented those things. So in this book, you'll, you know, read stories about people like this. Um, Sandy and Harry, who have a kind of world-class uh, turtle collection and succulent plant collection. Um, 
this man who is a, a former aerospace engineer, um, who's kind of like dedicated his inter interior living room as like kind of like a shrine to, to space exploration. Um, you know, just people who are, you know, normal people who have, you know, just beautiful homes that they've, they've, they've spent a lot of time, you know, developing and building their gardens. Um, this is a sculptor, Charles Dixon, who also happens to have the world's largest collection of super soakers. Um, the super soaker <laughs> itself was invented by a black aerospace engineer um, in, a neighbor, in a neighboring neighborhood. Um, this is a dog training club that's completely volunteer uh, run uh, by two former truck drivers. Um, they meet every Sunday to train people's dogs um, for free. This is a fountain that uh, a self-taught stonemason constructed in his backyard out of the rubble from the construction of the 105 freeway. Um, this is a, the Centennial Marching Band that has uh, special compositions that were written for it um, by Barry White's band leader. Um, you know, there's numerous car clubs and people who just you know, spent a lot of time developing their, their car collections. The guy on the right, his father was the mechanic on Herbie, uh, Herbie the Love Bug, and so he has this huge Beetle collection. This man runs a, uh, a horse and carriage business out of, his, uh, out of his backyard and takes people to prom and back uh, in his horse and carriage. So these are some examples of the kinds of things that are happening in Willowbrook that, that I think are easy to not, not see. You know, in some ways, I think there's a lot of um, you know, really specific structures of classism and racism that make people blind to these kinds of things. In other cases, it's just that it's in the backyard and you aren't going to see it because, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's not there um, on the street, street level. Um, so I think that project is designed to sort of change the way that people in the county were approaching that neighborhood. And so that's a, a book that was distributed both to everyone in the, in the neighborhood, everyone who was part of the project. It's sold as a fundraiser for the library. And also copies of it are given to anyone who works in the county who's working in Willowbrook. So people who work at Metro or for the planning department are given a copy of this book as kind of part of their dossier when they start working there. Um, so to kind of sum up, you know, I think that a typical way that people think about how arts are involved in a landscape is that like, well, they make cool things and they make an object and then people come and regard it and that's sort of the art interaction. Um, you know, I think the, the space where I mostly work is in this kind of in interstitial space. So, you know, instead of making a change in the landscape itself, you know, can you just change the way people are seeing that landscape? But I think the goal, of course, is not just sort of, for me, just an aesthetic one, to make people see a place differently and have maybe a, a more uh, kind of interesting or lovely experience, um, but also just to change the way that they themselves uh, see themselves and their relationship to the landscape. You know, the point is not just to change um, the way someone sees something, it's to change the way they interact with it. And that's what I hope to do with the work of interpretation. Thank you. Yay, thank you, Boston, for starting us off. Rostin mentioned to me that he's an artist in residence the, this year at the San Francisco Exploratorium. So if you're going to be in San Francisco, take a look for his work up there. Our second fantastic artist this morning is Crystal A.M. Nelson. She's a scholar and artist who examines representations of race, gender, and sexuality in high art and in popular culture. She holds an MFA from San Francisco Art Institute and is a PhD candidate in visual studies at the UC Santa Cruz. She's held numerous residencies, most recently with the McCall Center for Visual Art and Innovation. She has curated projects for a number of venues across the country, most recently at San Francisco Center for Sex and Culture. Her writing has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Art Practical, and Contact Sheet, among others. Please welcome Crystal A.M. Nelson. thousand policemen stays on the alert as the thousands of guardsmen patrol an area of 35 square miles. No formula, no water, and they, and they want us to survive out here. Multi-billion dollar company winds up not paying a penny in any federal income tax. Before the recession, 26 million Americans were on food stamps, now more than 46 million. This is an impressive crowd, the haves. And they have more. New York is now largely safe thanks to aggressive policing. He ain't armed, he don't got no gun, they just killed this nigga. This nightmare is unpleasant to think and talk about and difficult to face. But it is exactly for those reasons that we must. 
That and the fact that the vast majority of the world's population lives this nightmare day in and day out. Oppression, domination, and violence comprise the daily lived experiences of those of us who have long been marked for abuse and extermination. As a member of such targeted groups and as an artist, it is my obligation to grapple with this unbearable reality, to stare it in the face and illuminate its deleterious effects, trace the residue of historical trauma that seeps into contemporary life in ways that, while disturbing and surprising, are not unexpected. As Freud astutely argued, trauma returns and returns until adequately confronted and worked through. We only need to take account of recent events and scan the plethora of images circulating the media sphere to see just how right Freud was. And it is this material that is the foundation of my practice. I choose to journey deep within this nightmare. In doing so, I attempt to pronounce the unspeakable, to conjure the unfathomable. I aim to translate that which history has inscribed not only upon so many minds and bodies, but also the landscape. I do this by making visible what I call historical trauma from violent pleasure a transformative space where the cumulative psychological injuries from systemic hierarchical violence erupts into masochistic ecstasy. It can be considered an emancipatory space that has the potential to restore the split subject and recuperate personal agency. I also strive to interrogate those old familiar narratives many of us have come to accept as truths to push back hard against the belief that supposed physical markers of identity are any indication of one's politics, personal values, or of how one identifies socially and culturally. Drawing from the archive of real life, I use taboo imagery, language, and icons with materials ranging from found objects to appropriated text, images, and video, among other things, in order to tease out the nuances and complexities of history and identity and their multiplicities. And finally, I am determined to challenge all of us to come face to face with the complicity in the production of this fragmented world, with those things we'd rather not see and that we certainly would prefer not to know. Ever wonder why the people in power are the ones who determine if the people in power are abusing their power? Ever wonder why you have to complain to the police about the police? And why are the police the ones who determine if deadly force is justified and if an officer is reasonable at the time he murders an unarmed civilian or even a civilian armed with just a small knife or a screwdriver? Is that reasonable? If an officer has a license to kill 
and is armed with a semi-automatic weapon, a taser, and a baton, and has hundreds of colleagues to come to his rescue, why should or would he be afraid of an unarmed man, woman, or child, or a man, woman, or child armed with just a small knife or a screwdriver? Would it be reasonable for a cop to be afraid of that? Abject, confrontational, dark, abrasive, all words used to describe my work, and they are all apt. While dwelling in this space for as long as I have found it necessary has certainly takes a toll beyond words, I believe it is the, that the only way out is in. I believe that once we take that risk, we will come out on the other side. Whatever lies on the other side, I do not know, but it certainly has to be better than this. And I believe that we will make it there. Perhaps not unscathed, but certainly all the better for it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Crystal, for your voice and your vision. That was amazing. Thank you. It's really fun for me to get to introduce our last speaker. He's a longtime colleague and friend. Aaron Paley is the president and co-founder of Community Arts Resources, also known as CARS, and executive director and co-founder of Cicla Via, which just happened over the weekend, for those of you who might have seen all the bicyclists in the street, the nation's largest open streets event. Paley and his business partner, Katie Bergen, have propelled cars over the past quarter century to becoming a leading innovator in the activation of public space through content-driven programming, ephemeral interventions, and new models for design. He's also the founder of Yiddishkeit, the largest organization west of the Hudson dedicated to Jewish, Europe, Jewish Eastern European culture. He received a BA in architecture from UC Berkeley and an MBA in nonprofit arts management from UCLA. When I met Aaron in the late 80s, he was running a for-profit social benefit arts production company. He was so far ahead of the curve in having a hybrid organization, and none of us knew what that was about. And he was not functioning nonprofit, so he was way ahead of his time. I'm also very proud to say that he is a Stanton Fellow of the Durfee Foundation. Welcome to Aaron. Good, uh, good. Thank you. It's an honor to be considered an artist with these artists here on stage. Uh, I don't think of myself as an artist. Uh, I think of myself as a producer of arts events and as somebody who facilitates artists and works with them uh, to help give them the stage. Uh, and I do that through a, a variety of things. So what I wanted to talk to you about is how I got to doing this. Because as a kid, I wasn't interested in art at all. I made my mom, I remember in ninth grade, I was forced to be in an art class, and I asked my mom to get me out of it. I was like, how do I get out of this class? It's so boring, you know. <laughs> this is not my thing. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. I'm a native Angelino, which I'm very proud to be. And uh, there aren't many of us, but actually just last year, uh, the native Angelinos became the majority in Los Angeles for the first time since 1880. Uh, so things are changing. But um, I grew up in what I like to say, I grew up in Futurama. I grew up in Los Angeles as we were fully embracing the automobile and thinking about how everything about the future was going to be made better because we were going to embrace this new technology which was going to make everything fantastic. And it was, the, the automobile worked for a while because the scale of Los Angeles is so amazing. You can see that uh, uh, drawing on the, on the screen where you have Pittsburgh, uh, Baltimore, Mini, uh, Milwaukee, uh, San Francisco, Manhattan, I, I can't even, I don't even remember all the cities that fit into the city of Los Angeles. This is an enormous place. The scale of this city is 500 square miles, and that's just the city of 4 million in the county, which is even far bigger, of 10 million, in what I like to call the nation state of Los Angeles of 18 million people. And that's challenge of scale, the automobile worked really well. 
and it got us to a place where we could get anywhere in 20 minutes, and that was what we all said. Like somebody would say, well, how, how far is it? And we'd go, 20 minutes, everything is 20 minutes away in Los Angeles. And that was true until about 1985. <laughs> um, but it, you know, this is the Julia Shulman's famous picture of the case study houses, and it allowed us to, to live that, that dream or to think that we were living that dream because I just found out that Los Angeles is the 70, of the top 75 cities in the United States. We are number 75, the lowest in home ownership rates. Even New York has a higher home ownership rate. So we are no longer that city. And I'm telling you this story to tell you how I got to do what I do. So um, this is Tiny Nailers. We all drove our cars to, to do everything. We drove our cars. We drove up there and somebody came out on roller skates and served you uh, and you ate in your car. So that's what we did and it was great and it was the future. So that's how I grew up and I was really interested in thinking about the city. Like I didn't understand my own city. Uh, and I left and went to New York and San Francisco and Paris. I thought those were real cities. Um, and when I came back to L.A. in 1982, I decided not to have a car and to go carless, which everybody thought I was insane. And to, I, I started working in the arts. Uh, I had discovered the arts along the way, and uh, you know, much to my, my mother's surprise, I had embraced it as, as a power, of transformative power, because I had just... I don't know, it's like something, I realized that art and artists could interpret the world in a way that would help all of us. And I worked at the Craft and Folk Art Museum on something called the Mask Festival, and Edith Wiley, who was the, the founder of the Craft and Folk Art Museum, created this multicultural festival which embraced all of the diversity of Los Angeles in the, in, in the 1970s. And I thought she was, I didn't realize it, but looking back, she was so ahead of her time, and she really helped give me a path forward. And this is the Mask Festival taking over Wilshire Boulevard. And when I saw that, I realized I didn't want to work in museums anymore and put up exhibitions. I wanted to actually create things in the streets. I actually have a, forgot to say, I have a, a, a degree in architecture and I wanted to be an urban planner my whole life. I was trying to figure out Los Angeles as a planner and what it meant as from an urban perspective. So I said, well, you know what I want to do? I want to do art in the streets. I want to make public space, because there is no really good public space in Los Angeles. This is a city that lacks it. Um, you might think of, a, as I showed before, like we're great with uh, residential architecture, we're famous for our houses, but we're not necessarily famous for a place like Central Park or Golden Gate Park or, you know, a wonderful square. So um, what, what I was thinking about, um, as we started our work, as Claire said, we created something called Community Arts Resources uh, in the late 80s, and we, I had already set up a not-for-profit, the Fringe Festival was the first Fringe in the United States, and I said, I don't want to deal with a board, I don't want to have all of that craziness, I just want to do our work, so we set up a small business and said, we're just going to do it, you know, and we, we didn't talk about it being a social benefit corporation with a triple bottom line, we just said, oh, of course, we, we're going to do good stuff, and we're going to do good stuff for, for, for arts and for Los Angeles. We're going to be about community, we're going to be about arts, and we're going to be about providing resources to those people. So later, all this vocabulary started coming to us, oh, we're, we have a triple bottom line, you know, we're a hybrid organization, we just did what made sense. Um, and we also you know, looked for funding uh, by getting contracts instead of getting grants. And we found out that foundations would give us a contract instead of a grant. It was like a secret. Like, like, you don't need to get a grant. You can get a contract from them. Um, so this was a, one of the first public spaces that I was able to set up. It's called uh, California Plaza's Grand Performances. This is in 1989. Uh, it still exists uh, 25 years later. It's an ongoing outdoor free performing arts series that's run by Michael Alexander. Uh, I helped set this up in 1988 as part of the CRA's 1% for Art uh, program, and instead of creating a big public sculpture, we used the 1% to create a stage, and then I said that all of the buildings and the development around it would have to pay in perpetuity to allow the performing arts to function here, and that's the first thing. That was like my first contract. And, um, from there, we created other site-specific and context-driven and content-driven works. This is Sandra Tsinglo performing on the top of the freeway at rush hour to a spontaneous demographic of people stuck in rush hour traffic. Um, 
And that's uh, Sandra again at the car wash. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of things that we've done uh, to show you the kind of the range of ideas. And th these things actually just developed in a very ad hoc way. We didn't have a strategic plan. We didn't have a five-year plan. Because we weren't a nonprofit, we weren't thinking that we needed to do a plan to justify this to get a grant from somebody. We were looking at how we were going to make a living. So we got a contract to do the Santa Monica Festival. So 25 years later, we're still doing the Santa Monica Festival. It's this great celebration for the city. And it help, has helped rebrand the city in many ways as a cultural center. Um, this is the family festivals at the Getty. So then we got a contract to do the family festivals for the Getty Museum. We've been doing them for now 20 years. Uh, and we bring five to 10,000 people together at the Getty, either the Getty Center or the Getty Villa. Um, this is a, a, another family festival at the Getty Villa. And every time what we do is we try, we definitely don't work down to people. We actually try to elevate things. When we do a family festival, we aim for the highest common denominator, not the lowest. We think people are really smart, and if we design a really great workshop or a series of events that the adults are going to be engaged in, then the kids are going to want to do them. So uh, it's all working. So this is, we like to think about spectacle. We like to think about fun. Um, this is 100 taiko drummers in the streets for the opening of the Japanese American National Museum. Uh, this is a site-specific work with a, an artist that we uh, Peter Tigler, who creates these paint-by-number by murals that actually develop over time during the course of a day. Um, this is, uh, I helped redesign City Hall's Grand Park, which is uh, this new institution, a uh, new 16-acre uh, park in downtown Los Angeles as part of my urban planning meets, um, um, meets, meets the arts world, like integrating the arts into that site. Uh, this is GLOW, which was a, um, it's, it's happened three times, it's on the beach, it's uh, site-specific art, and it, this is like working on a large scale. Like, so I have a team of five producers in-house so that we can actually produce these large-scale events. This had a quarter of a million people show up for it. Um, and we also do, uh, we have urban planners and staff, and we're thinking about working with neighborhoods, rebranding neighborhoods. This is Chinatown Summer Nights. This was a, a, a concept that we came up with to get people to come downtown to, to Chinatown to go shopping and to go to the restaurants. So it's really a, something that was driven primarily to, to get businesses more money, but we created it as a cultural context. and. Create, made it content-driven so that everybody wins in this situation. So the businesses do well and people learn about stuff. This is the opening of the Downtown Women's Center. This is a parade that we did down the street, reactivating Broadway. So in all of our things that we're doing, we're thinking about um, where we are in the neighborhood, how we can integrate the arts effectively, what we can do differently, um, how we can think of this seamlessly and authentically, and how we can redefine the place so that people coming to that site will think about it differently. So this is the Immigrant Rights March from 2006, and it was an inspiration for me to start thinking about other models for LA and thinking bigger now, like even bigger than a, than a square or a park. And so this was a million people, and uh, I couldn't believe, I had never seen a million people on the streets, and I got a grant, thank you, uh, I got a fellowship from Claire, which led to me discovering Ciclovia in Bogota, Colombia, and creating something in LA, a car-free event, which is now on the scale of the city, which everybody just adores. It's really the, the, the darling of Los Angeles now. It's the largest car-free event in the United States. We have 50 to 100,000 people on the streets. We take over six to 10 miles, and we have created a new brand for LA. We've actually, so what I've done is I've started in the arts, working with communities and thinking about how content and artists can recreate space, and now we're working on the scale of the city and redefining Los Angeles for Angelinos and allowing us to retake the streets as our public space and so that we don't need to just have uh, good public spaces in shopping malls or in the Getty Center, but every single street in Los Angeles is now a public space that belongs to us, and we're redefining this now not only for Los Angeles, but other cities are beginning to copy us because they're saying if Los Angeles can do this, then San Jose can do it or San Antonio could, can do it. And these are the cities that are, have, are coming to us and looking for, to us for inspiration. And so I, I'll leave you with that. Uh, it's like uh, this last image, I was 
San Fernando Valley in March, and this woman was on the phone, and she was, it was the end of the day, the sun was setting, and she said, you, you have to come down here. People are happy. <laughs> so thank you very much. And now we are happy too. Can you not just be optimistic after this? I am filled with hope. We are blessed to have Rostin and Crystal and Aaron with us this morning and in our communities and in our lives. So thank you for being artists in our lives. So thank you all.